Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we'll talk about how you can win a war of attrition. Could it be that nobody wins? Could it be that somebody does have to ultimately win? Our guest for the show is Shackley Ruffetto, retired judge, chief judge of the Second Circuit Court of Hawaii. Welcome to the show, Shackley. Glad to be here, Jay. I'm looking forward to our discussion as usual. Well, you and I have had many discussions, and you you traveled around the world. Um, you know, retired uh, reserve with the United States Navy Reserve. You served in the Marine Corps. You have a certain understanding of mm, geopolitics, and for that matter, military affairs, and for that matter, war. So I'd like to have your thoughts about uh, what is a war of attrition? How can you tell it's a war of attrition? Is what is going on in Ukraine a war of attrition? What can we learn from it? Your thoughts? Um, first off, let me just say I know and I've been to uh, Kiev several times. I've been to Russia a number of times. I have lots of Russian friends and Ukrainian friends. So I, I know the people in, in some of the areas pretty at least as well as a lot of Americans. Um, well, my view is, which I expressed earlier, is that uh, most, almost all wars that are not uh, resolved by some sort of political compromise are essentially wars of attrition. They just go on and on and on until one side is exhausted and the other side wins. Usually that's calibrated based on the population, the fight, especially the uh, manpower, quote unquote, populate fighting population that's available, uh, and the in industrial base. That's why, for instance, uh, if uh, Hitler had had thought about the huge industrial base that he was uh, going to face when he declared war on America after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, he he would have never done it because there's no way he could he could ever have. Uh, defeated a country that can produce what a thousand bombers a, a month, uh, and and industrial production at that level, and and uh, people talk about Russia and Ukraine in those terms, and attribute a great deal more industrial capability uh, to the Russian side, and of course they have a much larger population base. In fact, I looked up some statistics, and they this is one source, statista.com says that um, manpower reserves in Russia are about 69 and a half million. Ukraine is about 23.8 million. And armed uh, soldier, active soldiers in Russia is about 1.3 million, 900,000 on the Ukrainian side. So there's a substantial, um, you know, large, substantially larger uh, labor force available, and then the industrial base we know is big. Plus, they have all of the old Soviet reserve um, equipment, although that's rapidly being eroded. Um, uh, the Kiev Independent, um, which is a news source in, in Ukraine, yesterday estimated the current losses for the Russian side have been about 630,000 soldiers killed or wounded and that they've lost 8,600 tanks in the war so far. Uh, we don't know about the Ukrainian losses. They're probably at least half that much, but that's an enormous amount of of loss already. And we see that the, uh, while there, there's, there is currently some slow progress in the Donbass towards Prokofsk, which is apparently a rail center, so the Russians are pushing there, but they're very, it's very slow. And and then we have the um, initiative up uh, towards Kursk by the Ukrainians uh, crossing into into Russia. But you you look at that and you think, well, so what? You know, <laughs> what has really changed, and what's likely to change in the very near future? I mean, I don't think that Ukraine's going to capture the city of Kursk and its nuclear nuclear power plant. And uh, and I, I do, although it does look like Russia may be able to make um, additional advances uh, in the Donbas, we also have um, Belarus and Wagner and some Russian forces massing on the Belarus border, which is drawing away uh, Ukrainian forces to the north. I guess they're laying huge minefields and 
and building some defensive fortifications there. But it seems to be fairly st st not stagnant, but um, I, I guess immobilized in in a way. There's fighting going back and forth, more more or less with smaller units, but nothing great, nothing big is happening. And both uh, uh, Zelensky is talking more like maybe. Uh, it'd be a good time to sit down. I think he's got some initiatives going. Putin Putin at least talks about it now, even though he's still pretty one-sided in the way he describes things. But you do wonder how much longer the soldiers can go on. Uh, I did look up, I, remember, I remembered this, that the army psychologists after the invasion of Normandy in World War II said that uh, if, uh, there was a sharp drop in combat effectiveness after 30 days of soldiers being in action. Remember in World War II, soldiers went into a unit, they went into war, they stayed there until the end of the war. They were they were injured. It wasn't like Vietnam where you were there a year and then you got cycled out or even other, other wars. And that after 45 days, they say they were in a near vegetative state. Now they were offense in offensive operations against well fortified german positions so it was pretty tough fighting but their combat effectiveness de you know deteriorated very quickly and we and here we have two years over two years now of warfare on in ukraine between ukraine and russia and those people have to be pretty close to insanity uh, it would seem to me, it, with the stress uh, that they're undergoing and the losses that they've experienced and the horror and the fighting, I mean, it's the savagery, it's, it's just incredible to even think about. I noticed that there was one commentator who said that because desertions have been occurring on the Ukrainian side, they have treated the first absence of a soldier that's unauthorized not to be desertion for uh, military justice purposes. I'm not sure how they're implementing that, but that's an indication of uh, of low morale. And also, they've they they too, as as the Russians have, have began conscripting uh, convicts into into fighting forces. The 59th Brigade of the Ukrainian Army are all convicts. One of whom I saw an interview of. He was he had a 10 year prison term. They sprung him and put him on the front line. He's fighting in, for Ukraine now. So you you have this sort of situation going on now, and you wonder just how much longer the, the, the people, the human beings, can even sustain this. I had a thought from what, what you say, Shackley. My thought is that all of this is in a kind of suspense, an attrition, but it's a, in a, a suspense. And the suspense is waiting for new technology that will change the battlefield paradigm. You know, for example, um, I read recently that the North Koreans have provided some kind of new glide bomb, uh, and the Russians are using that. I don't know if it solves all their problems, but it may give them an advantage. And and Putin is, you know, is trading oil for those weapons, and he's asking the North Koreans and uh, other organizations like Iran to provide him the very latest and greatest uh, new battlefield technologies. And I don't know if they've actually achieved a, um, you know, a, a change up type of uh, battlefield technology, but I think there must be some things in the pipeline. For example, you know, laser cannons that the, uh, the U.S. is uh, developing or trying to develop um, for the Navy. Um, and it's very cheap to operate them. They require a lot of energy. Obviously, it's a laser. Um, but this could, you know, this could be a change, a change, uh, change up. And uh, I can't think of anything else right now. But I think there are a lot of people in the world who are trying to think of things uh, that that will that will make advantage for one side or the other. Ultimately, both sides. I mean, this has been a war. That's dynamic in the mm -hmm. sense that it started out with certain strategies and tactics. It started out with certain weapons, certain organizational structures, and it's changed. In two years, it has changed 
um, different arrangements, different weapons, um, different tactics. All of it is different. And it has changed not only for the Ukraine and against Russia, and vice versa. It has changed for the battlefield everywhere because mm -hmm. the whole world is watching. And if they see a new system, a new design being deployed, um, they're going to copy that. I mean, mm -hmm. look, for example, at what happened in Israel. So we had these, uh, what, these kite things. You'll see that again. Um, they had all these um, swarm missiles. We've already seen that in the Ukraine. Um, and of course, the drones, never forget the drones. They're getting more sophisticated all the time. And you can say, well, one drone is like another drone, but the technology is developing very rapidly and it is profoundly better than it was a year or two ago. So my point, see if you agree, is that yes, it's a war of attrition. Yes, they're getting tired, exhausted, not only the troops in the field, but the families and the children and the organization, the economies behind them getting exhausted. However, they're waiting. Whether they think about waiting or not, they are in fact waiting for a technology that will change things. They've had some, but they're waiting for more, for better, for more destructive technology. What do you think? On the Ukrainian side, the, uh, the ingenuity uh, for new technology. I mean, they always say war drives technology and innovation. Well, that's absolutely true. And World War II is the best example. Um, and on the Ukrainian side, they've been incredibly skillful and creative. I mean, they created these seaborne drones that basically destroyed the Black Sea fleet of the Russians. And, and here you have a naval victory by a country that doesn't even have a navy, basically. It's astonishing. And then they've created uh, drone warfare. I mean, they basically created that. And the latest iteration that I've seen is this devil drone that drops thermite. Have you seen that? It's incredible. It must be terrifying to see one of those things coming for, uh, for the Russian soldiers. Uh, so they have a, a demonstrated incredible creativity. They've gotten the high-tech stuff from the West, which I'm sure they're learning from, and I'm sure we have people there teaching them and you know, in uh, assisting them in, in developing further technologies. I understand they've also recently developed a, a cruise missile, long-range cruise missile. And, of course, we know that they're hitting uh, targets way, way into Russia now, which was never even thought possible before. I mean, it's extraordinary changes. Uh, maybe they're even working on a nuclear weapon. Who knows? But uh, but big changes. Whereas on the Russian side... We were, we, we had, there was always a lot of talk about the depths and, and size of the Russian military industrial complex and also all of the, the Soviet uh, weapons that they had in storage. But apparently they didn't take very good care of that, those weapons in storage or they didn't have as many as we thought because now, as you say, they're, they're having to go to North Korea for artillery shells and artillery they just are getting uh, these ballistic missiles from Ukraine. I thought that that might be enough to convince the Americans and the British and the West to allow deep penetration use of um, attackums and other long-range Western weapons. And I have a feeling it might, although they just, you know, they're um, dragging their feet about it for some political reason. But um, if you look at the innovation on the uh, Russian side, they're have they're using drone warfare and there's electronic interference and so on going on. But then they built these had to build these big cages on their tanks and their and their armored personnel carriers that that the drones are still destroying. If you look at it, it's, it looks pretty primitive. They put a net over the tank and it's supposed to stop the drone, and you wonder it's, if it really does. Or you get the feeling they just hide. You know, they want to hide. <laughs> so you can see what's coming. But will the technological changes make a difference? Yeah, if we get if if they get attackums, and they get them in sufficient uh, uh, quantities and start hitting uh, Russia and uh, you know uh, deep into Russia uh, on military targets, they're also destroying us a pretty good portion of the uh, or a growing proportion, let's say, of the oil production, which of course is the the basis of the. Russian economy and also sanctions, I think, are are playing a role here. We don't talk much about that, but that's definitely over time. 
um, going to affect Russia. Plus, Russia is now a pariah in the West. Uh, they've Putin has destroyed Russia for the foreseeable future, no matter what happens. And I, I and I, the, however this uh, war is resolved, Ukrainians are going to hate Russians forever. And uh, there, there will be some kind of Ukraine. We just don't know what it is yet and how that's going to work out. I, I could technology make the difference in terms of a win boy i don't know i think that's still up in the air it could it could make a difference in terms of the negotiating positions that it ultimately um are arrived at you know and how how the horse trading goes um but i think yeah. would have to happen to really make a, a significant difference and then the problem is is if the, if the ukrainians get too successful then you have this you know, Russia has 5,889 nuclear warheads. So while he's threatened and never followed through on the threat, it's still there and it needs to be considered. Well, if he gets desperate, you know, if they begin blowing up Moscow, um, if they begin uh, assassinating leaders around him, um, I, I think he's going to be desperate enough to try that out, if not on a larger scale than maybe on a tactical scale. Let me offer another thought, see what you think. When we talk about war these days, when we talk about a war of attrition, war has become a collaboration. You know, look at Iran. Iran doesn't, you know, except once in a while, engage in, in kinetic war. It uses proxies. It mm -hmm. has its agents and friends everywhere in the Middle East and 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 beyond that, even in the U.S., um, so you know its its hostile uh, in, intentions can be realized in a number a number of ways with its friends. And if you look at uh, at Putin, you know he's been developing relations, based basically economic relations by selling gas and oil for weapons to various countries around the world who who prefer to um, do the transaction rather than um, take a moral position. So yes, uh, he's a pariah for some places, but for others, he's a practical solution to their oil and gas problems um, or their geopolitical problems. And he's trying to establish a, a global network, okay, who can help him on this war. Uh, at the same time, he's going further than that in terms of Western Europe. You know, I believe that the uh, alternative for Deutschland, a right-wing organization that likes Putin, supports Putin, is is against uh, Ukraine and for Russia in this war, um, is something that that he might very well have created and supported. Remember that you know he he was the KGB in Eastern Europe, and that's where Eastern Germany, and that's where this got started. But there are other right-wing organizations in Europe um, that are likewise, uh, you know, uh, you know, sympathetic to him. So what you have is an ongoing effort by Putin to have a hybrid war. And hybrid covers a lot of ground. It covers uh, social media, disinformation. He's doing that in the U.S. right now. The Department of Justice has caught him with his hand in that. Um, and, and so what you have is war has become a war of attrition, not only by the identified um, parties, but by their friends and their hybrid um, sympathizers. And so when we say that maybe Russia will suffer attrition, when we say that Ukraine will suffer attrition, you know, the reality is that both of them have to rely on their friends. And mm -hmm. I would say that um, Putin has been successful in undermining the German determination um, to help Ukraine, uh, likewise other countries in Europe. And I think he's been successful in undermining the American determination to help Ukraine. Um, so the war is a war where attrition affects not only the players on the battlefield, but everybody who supports them or sympathizes with them. Your thoughts? Well, on attrition, just as, as a segue, 
Eric Prince, the, the, the gentleman who started Blackwater, he says, you don't win until you've killed 30% of the fighting age males of the other side. <laughs> but but on on the the um, uh, reliance upon uh, outside resources issue, um, yeah, Russia has. I was surprised how quickly Russia went to North Korea and Iran and these other places to to get hardware assistance. It um, because I thought that their industrial military industrial complex was a lot stronger than that. I thought they could keep probably generate whatever it was they needed because their population base and the size of the of the nation. And I think people in the West thought that too. So it was a bit surprising to see them suddenly uh, basically becoming reliant on these other sources. And I'm sure China is in there providing a lot of resources as well. We just, we just don't talk about it and they keep quiet about it. But I think that's a, a partial reflection of the fact that um, I think that the sanctions are are helping a lot. Uh, we don't talk about that as much, but the ruble is not doing well. They can't uh, engage in international financial transactions. That's just, that's affecting the the oligarchs and their resources and their freedoms. And I think that that's helping and that's contributing to the reason that they have to go to these other outside sources. Whereas on the Ukrainian side, they are relying upon outside sources for sure. Uh, if it hadn't been for the United States, they would have lost a long time ago because Europe quantitatively has nothing, basically, um, if you think about it, right? I guess there's some realization in the European Union now that th maybe they should do something about that. I doubt that they will. Um, they're dependent on the United States for the foreseeable future. And so the real key is how long the United States will uh, will continue to support in quantity and what sort of quality will provide. I think it'll be a lot. I don't think whoever becomes president that will sell Ukraine down the river. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, you have to think a million young people have died in this. My God, you know, that's a human catastrophe. No matter who wins, that's a catastrophe for humanity. And uh, if the border has to move a little bit, well, you know, maybe that's just the way it is. And, you know, North Korea, South Korea has done pretty well, uh, even though they had to have their their nation state divided in half by force of arms. Never. I don't think they ever did have a have a, a peace treaty. Right. It's just an armistice. Yeah, right. yeah. But they've done so well. You know, you think of a war of attrition. You think of the uh, the trenches in World War One. You think of the you know completely destroyed environment and um, you know industrial capacity of the countries involved. You think about virtually millions of people dying and their lives being completely turned upside down. <clears throat> that happened in World War One and World War Two. We forget so quickly just how destructive it was. But I guess my question is, we, we think of a war of attrition as trench warfare out of World War I. We think of destroyed farms and fields and farmhouses and all that. But a war of attrition can also become a world war. Uh, it, you know, the thing is, you, you'd like to see it as static. You'd like to see it as push-pull. You know, they never gained a meter. We never gave them a meter. Uh, we we stood by the trenches or whatever the defense point was. But but it could be a world war. And in some ways, my point earlier, in some ways, with all this collaboration and support uh, that they get or want to get, it is a world war. It's just not a world war in, in the sense that it was for World War One and World War Two. How close do you think we are to a world war, Shackley? Well, it could be if you if you look at it from the Sun Tzu point of view of winning without war. I think it might fit that definition. And and where does it, a war of attrition go? You know, we when we spoke before, you know, I offered the thought that nobody wins a war of attrition, and in some ways that that's clear. But your thought, and you had a quote that I thought was profound about how somebody always wins a war. You can't not win. You can't not have a winner. Your thoughts on yeah. that? 
Well, that was a quote from uh, Sir Arthur Harris, who was who was uh, called Bomber Harris. He was the head of the Bomber Command for the British Air Force in World War II, and he he was criticized over the years for for area bombing of German cities, and and he he was asked about that. And he said that no matter what rules you follow, what rules of war are postulated by different organizations and and countries, the bottom line is that you have to win. And uh, that's what ultimately he and he, he also said that as wars go on, they become more and more and more savage. And that's true. That's true. History shows that it's just the way it goes and that civilians are always involved. They're, they're, it's nation states fighting nation states, and that involves everybody. And uh, World War II certainly proved that. I mean, uh, the U.S. and the and the Brits area bombed German cities. We firebombed most of the major Japanese cities before we dropped two atomic bombs. But they weren't going to give up until they were just defeated. Period. And uh, and and the results were. And Harris makes this point as well. We he he felt he did it to save lives ultimately by trying to shorten the continuing killing on both sides. And now there's that argument. People have made that argument for the use of the atomic bomb. I think it has some credibility. But both of those countries, um, uh, even considering your comments about the AFD in Germany, both of those countries became democracies and have basically been okay for 80 years. And that's that, that's pretty good for two countries that had been pretty aggressive uh, historically, Japan had, you know, invaded China and Korea and and Taiwan and all those countries in Asia, and Germany had 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 been engaged. Had you know, Franco-Prussian War, they invaded France, and then the World War One, they invaded France, and and then World War Two, France and Germany, or France and Russia, and North Africa and Italy, and so on. The history of war is told by the survivors. And it's hard to get your your head in the head of a million people who died, many of them in awful circumstances and agony, mm -hmm. wounded, dismembered, and all the worst things, the worst way to die. But we can't talk to them. They're dead. Uh, we can only talk to the people who survived. And they're not necessarily a, a good record of what happened. What's more, and I think it's clear now, uh, how many years after World War II, um, they forget. Even the people who could tell you secondhand information about how a war went, um, they 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 forget. And we, as a you know, as a, as a world, we forget, and we're bound, you know, to repeat it. If we forget history, uh, we're bound to repeat history. I think that's that's clearly established i was gonna say i think we we can never we should never forget that the 20th century saw over 100 million people died as a result of government aggression throughout the world 100 million people just think how much bigger the western world would be if if all those people hadn't died and how much more productive and effective it would be today and I, I also share this. I read a book recently about the history of the Mediterranean, the nations around the Mediterranean Sea from the beginning to World War I, and it, it written by a professor from Cambridge. And, and, and it was astonishing. The whole history of humanity in that area, and I'm sure it's the rest of the world, is war, rape, pillage, it's slavery, war, rape, pillage, slavery, one after another after another uh, for, until today. And we have the same thing going on in the 21st century. Shame on us that we can't create some way to deter this kind of behavior in other nations and people. And that's what it takes, in my opinion, is real heavy-handed, fisted, double-fisted deterrence so that people just don't go out and do things like this. Well, the United Nations is not that organization. But if, if you're if you're moving toward the thought, that we need a global organization that will stop these conflagrations. I agree with you. 
And uh, the United Nations has to be reformed or rebuilt or replaced uh, so that if something goes wrong somewhere, you have real troops coming in and stopping the brutality. We don't have that yet. Uh, you know, um, I forget who, who was, uh, said this, but it was not a bad idea. He said we should forget the, the United Nations because it's proven itself ineffective. And we should make a new organization of the Western nations. And uh, because we're more or less like-minded and we have like values and, and, and cultures and societies and, uh, and build our strength on that. And then to the extent that other nations can, you know, prove that they're trustworthy enough to join in, then include them as we go along. But to continue to uh, support organizations that, that uh, are really counterproductive in a lot of ways uh, makes no sense. Yeah, as well as humankind perfectible or not. And you can say that we're better off, you know, the old political question, are we better off than we were four years ago? You can say that in some ways we're better off, but are we better off as a, as a species? I, I'm not sure. Go back to the Mediterranean issue. I think one thing we have to recognize about all these wars and inhumanities that, that took place there and elsewhere uh, over the years since then and even now today, they all have an effect on the species, on the history of humanity. They all have an effect on you know, global, global affairs. Um, and uh, sometimes, you know, maybe over time, it's not easy to say this is good, but they, they have a long-term um, positive political effect or social effect. Maybe we learn by the war. Uh, on the other hand, we keep destroying ourselves. There's got to be a better way. Well, we had the Holocaust, and we said never again. You know, I don't think we learn much. I, it seems to me that the human human nature is constant. It's the same as it's been for what two hundred fifty thousand years. We have the same mental capacity, and we're, we're still doing the same things. And it's just <laughs> inherent. And the only way to handle that is through uh, deterring negative behavior. And uh, then you do that with with the threat of force, and that's the way it's always been. Yeah, that's the way it's always been, and that's the way it's likely to be. Okay, well, I'm going to return to the a presumptive question of our discussion. <laughs> you uh, get back to the barroom discussion. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the question I I wrote, which we said we were going to discuss, is how can you win a war of attrition? So after all this, what's your answer? Well, um, we we thought in World War One because of the horrible losses of uh, uh, of the stalemate of attrition, that if we could develop some method of maneuver warfare, in which which uh, uh, took the form of uh, tanks, uh, then we could move rapidly across a battlefield, and and they developed these concept of what they were referred to generally as maneuver warfare, which the Germans perfected and used in, in the opening part of World War II, extremely effective. They, they, instead of fighting in these in trenches and across huge fronts with waves of men like is going on in Ukraine right now, you could have huge groups of tanks that would, would fo be focused on the sphere punk, which is the point of maximum effect on the, on the other line, which might be a point of weakness, and you'd punch through and then you drive on through rapidly and you you disrupt um, uh, uh, command structures and, and uh, supply and so on. And then the, the uh, other side would begin to collapse, even though they were still in their trenches. So that was that was what was thought would, would work well. And it has. It worked in Desert Storm and and the Iraqi war and so on. But we had overwhelming uh, advantages in terms of force. But it's it hasn't worked in Ukraine because uh, I think I, I think what they say is because there's no air superiority, and it's difficult to move forward with with um, armored vehicles if you don't have air superiority. And now we've got this drone issue, which has really complicated that whole picture. I don't know if we're ever going to get back to a point where you just have a bunch of fighter planes go over and create air superiority, and and that's it, and you can move your tanks forward because if the other side has a million drones 
and can swarm them. I don't know if you're going to be able to to use armored vehicles in that way. And I think that's what people are, you know, thinking about now and watching closely what's going on in Ukraine for that reason. Well, one of the other reasons to watch what happens uh, in Ukraine is the clear implication that Ukraine affects us all. Uh, you said earlier that war has come to include civilians and civilian cities and towns and everything. Um, and although, um, you know, Ukraine is a long way from where we are, it does have an effect or could have an effect on everyone everywhere. So mm -hmm. I put this question to you. This is the hardest question of the discussion. So if you are worried about a war of attrition, if you are worried that a war of attrition is coming to a city or town near you somehow, um, what can you do? Where can you go? How can you prepare? What can you do to escape the implications for you? Oh, well, you mean if you lived in Ukraine or something like that? Anywhere. If this is going to be a war of attrition that somehow through proxies, through collaboration of the of the people on the battlefield to other areas, other groups, um, there's no place that's exempt, uh, yeah. theoretically. So what do you do? What, what do I do? What You know, I, I keep saying, well, hey, let's go to Tasmania. That's not going to help either, is it? No. Um, you know, humanity is in trouble here because millions, hundreds of millions of people are at risk for a war going out of control. And right. what are you going to do? How are you going to protect yourself and your family? Well, if you make it personal, I would you support your side, you never give up, and you do what's necessary to win. Whatever that is. Yeah. Scary. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's the way it's always been. Uh, we hope that things could be different, but history doesn't bear it out. That's all, that's what I'm saying. It's, it it yeah. would be nice if things were different and we could all live by the Marcus of Queenberry rules. Uh, but this, human nature just doesn't support that, I don't think. Well, it seems to get more threatening all the time, especially with nuclear weapons and high tech. I mean, back in the day of Napoleon, um, the ladies and gents would stand on the outside of the battlefield and watch the battle unfolding. And that was so in the American Revolution, too. You, you, As a civilian, you wouldn't necessarily be affected. But that whole notion of being exempt from the violence, I think that's over. Yeah. And we all, have, we all have to worry to some extent that we cannot be exempted. Yeah, here's another thing is I think that young people, I'm speculating here, Young people, they don't. They think World War II is ancient, ancient. World War One for sure. All of that is ancient history, and um, it's not part of. I think about it because I was born in 1942. It's part of my DNA, but they don't. They don't. It's you know Vietnam is even ancient history. I think that's just human nature. I don't fault them for that. That's just the way it goes. People don't remember those things except maybe historians. But it's just a shame that we don't learn those lessons. I mean, my God, what do we ha what has to happen before we learn those lessons? Well, I think they taught those lessons more in school when I went to school and you went to school than they're teaching them now. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and, you know, and Santayana was the guy that said, uh, history repeats itself. And if you don't study history, you will repeat it. Mm -hmm. um, now, you can say it doesn't repeat exactly, that it only echoes but that's bad enough. Anyway, Shackley, thank you so much for this discussion. I think it's a very valuable discussion, and it should be you know, provocative and provide some thoughtful reflection by the people who hear it. Thank you so much for being on Think Tech, Shackley. Thanks, Jay. Take care. Mm -hmm.